afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Susan McKenzie, as the little name says there, and this is an insight conversation hosted by the Emergency Services Foundation. Um, most of you know that we are, we are very keen on improving the mental health outcomes right across the Victorian emergency services sector, and we collaborate with 14 agencies to do that. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we're on, and for me, that's the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation here on the Mornington Peninsula. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging as we discuss how we manage the human dimensions of disaster. I also recognise the irony of that acknowledgement in relation to our topic today. In terms of disasters, most recently, fires, storms, COVID have been front of mind in Victoria. And just today, 15 Australian incident controllers left for Canada to assist their efforts to manage the horrendous fires, forest fires over there. We're a country routinely faced with disasters. The emotional and behavioural impact of disasters on survivors and responders are not customarily included in, in disaster planning. Missing from many of the discussions is the importance of our human reactions to trauma and tragedies. We know many people today have PTSD because their trauma was not addressed effectively at the time. Today we have three speakers and one visitor. You can see my cat in the background. They're very cosy asleep on the bed. She probably won't contribute, although she might. Today we have three speakers who will bring us three very different areas of expertise to this discussion. We've got Shell Bratis, who's in Norway, very early in the morning in Norway, and, and Shell's um, on a farm in northern Norway visiting his, his in-laws. So thank you for joining us, Shell. We have Shannon Hood and we have Graham Dwyer and they're both in Melbourne. How, how this is going to work is that I will ask a series of questions, but I also encourage you to think of questions as well. And you can enter those on the in the text box on the right hand side of your screen and, and I will ask those questions on your behalf. So let's start with Shell, seeing he got up so early in the morning for us. So Shell has been in the front lines of crisis communication during some of Norway's most devastating incidents. He's held important crisis management management positions after the tsunami in the Indian Ocean, the terrorist attacks in Oslo and in Utoya in 2011, and of course COVID more recently. His practical experience working with private companies and the Norwegian government ministries has been applied in writing a couple of books, firstly about crisis communication, and we had him speak um, over here in Australia a couple of years ago about that, and more recently on the human dimensions of disaster. It was his most recent book on this topic which sparked my interest in having this discussion. So welcome, Shell. Thank you. Well, <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, so I've got some questions here. And the first one is, um, after researching first responders around the world, um, what would you say they have in common in regards to um, uh, the need to follow up after handling a disaster? Um, that's a very good question. And what I have found is that it's uh, very important to think uh, long term because what I have found when I've talked to people around the world is that they have many of the same challenges uh, after they have handled a very difficult uh, disaster. And many times people say that uh, the first year might be kind of okay, but it might be the second year or the fifth year or even the 10th year after that they have a, a psychological or even a physical reaction. So you really need to think uh, long-term. And uh, I've also found that the hindsight can be very difficult for first responders because uh, after a few weeks, after something has happened and after they have handled a difficult uh, situation, there might be media reports and after a, a year or so, there might be after action reports. 
that point out that uh, things uh, could or should have been done differently, but that it, that was impossible to know when they handled the situation. So uh, that can make it uh, it harder to 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 realize that uh, they really did what they they could at the time and with the knowledge they had at the time. And the last point is that uh, I found too that uh, many of these uh, after action reports and the media attention that follows uh, and the media attention that comes up uh, many years after a, a tragedy can uh, instill uh, difficulties uh, psychological difficulties because they are, are scrutinizing what happened and uh, might be very critical about how uh, first responders uh, reacted. And when you, your definition of first responders is a little bit different, isn't it? Yes, uh, in my book, I wanted to include a large number of uh, first responders. I didn't just want to write about the, the, the people who arrive uh, with uh, vehicles with the blue lights, because I found that uh, there are so many other uh, people who also respond to a disaster that uh, you need to think about afterwards. And they include, for example, reporters and photographers who are on the scene and have to face difficult uh, challenges ministers who, who who take part in uh, in funerals uh, for example uh, nurses and doctors we've seen now during covid 19 and even uh, practitioners like myself who work with uh, crisis communication might have a reaction afterwards and you need to have some kind of uh, follow-up okay so from your studies, I mean, you've been right around the world in researching the book that you've done. Do you have any examples of international best practice for taking care of first responders after a disaster? Yes, and I think it's very nice to see that uh, quite a lot of work is being done in this field. And uh, I think more and more focus in is now on the first responders the aftermath also of uh, first responders who have handled uh, a difficult situation. I think a very good example is uh, what's called the UK police treatment centers okay. in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are two physical uh, large centers that uh, police officers, officers uh, can come to for treatment after they have experienced uh, uh, an especially difficult uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And they have a good system there where uh, p uh, the police officers pay a small uh, price every month uh, based on their salary. And uh, all that money goes into these treatment centers so that they can offer free uh, treatment to police officers who need it. And they treat about 4,000 uh, police officers every year. So it's a very successful uh, way of doing it. Uh, something else I learned uh, when I was uh, doing research and you might have talked about this in, in earlier conversations, is a, a treatment called EMDR, which stands for uh, a special eye movement uh, therapy. And that has proved to be very, very successful, uh, especially for uh, police officers who have, uh, have vi witnessed something uh, really gruesome. Uh, and maybe the third I would like to mention is, uh, I'm not sure if you have that in Australia, we don't have that in, in Europe, but in the States they have uh, great success with what they call uh, resiliency centers, which are centers that are, are, are built up and are functioning uh, maybe a couple of weeks after something, uh, after a disaster, and it lasts for several years. And it's supposed to be uh, like a one-stop shop for people who need help and they can help get help uh, for for uh, law uh, questions about law questions about uh, money and financial issues and also psychological help and uh, i went to see the resiliency center in newtown in connecticut uh, that was opened up in 2012 after the sandy hook shooting and uh, it's still open and they plan to have it open until 2024 which is 12 years after the kids were killed. Uh, wow. And they have seen that uh, actually just a couple of years ago, they had a rise in uh, visitors. Uh, and then it was the first responders who had been at the scene in 2012, who finally uh, realized that they needed, uh, needed some kind of help. And so they went to these resilience centers instead of perhaps internal to their organization. Yes, and these resi resiliency centers are open to anyone. 
uh, to first responders, uh, to the, the public who responded, and also to survivors and the bereaved who might need help uh, several years after something has happened and after the Family Assistance Centre has, uh, has closed down. Well, I know there's people who are listening who will find that very, very interesting. Um, in your book, you talk about the dilemmas that reporters face when covering a disaster. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, and that's something I find very interesting and I think uh, maybe more research should be done into that uh, around the world uh, because uh, I've talked to several reporters who, who said that uh, uh, it was very difficult for them uh, when they came to the scene. And uh, we saw that uh, 10 years ago when we had the tragedy at uh, Utøya, the island where uh, a terrorist uh, shot 69 uh, people, killed 69 people. And of course, that was a very big tragedy in Norway and it was a big news story around the world. And nobody knew what was happening out on the island. We just got some small reports by text messages and uh, through Twitter. And finally, some of the survivors started arriving on the land side uh, of Utøya. And the ambulance people, uh, staff were there, of course, but also the, a lot of reporters. And I found it very difficult to kind of balance uh, being uh, human, uh, helping them, uh, etc., and at the same time standing there with a camera and a microphone and, and knowing that the whole world wanted to know uh, their stories. So in my opinion, they did a good job because they, they asked very politely, very cautiously about uh, interviews. And of course, some of, the, some of the survivors were very eager also to share uh, their stories. Uh, and after they had uh, done an interview, uh, the reporters, most of the time, asked a second time, are you sure you want this to go live? Because they knew that uh, the people were in shock. But of course, mm. that's a difficult uh, dilemma and a difficult uh, situation. Mm. We've also seen that there are dilemmas around the world. I am sure that's the case in, in Australia and New Zealand too. And we've seen that in, in uh, in Europe and in, in the US about uh, how to mention or if we should mention the name of the perpetrator. And more and more now uh, media uh, outlets uh, have decided not to mention the name of the terrorist or the mass shooter. And that's something that uh, I think is, uh, is good because uh, many of these uh, perpetrators do what they do because they want attention, want attention to their names. And if we avoid using their names, uh, that might help in, in that uh, situation. I remember several years ago, there was an incident here in Australia where some firefighters were uh, tragically died. And I was head of communications at the time. And I had the television news ca cameras you know, asking me for names of people, et cetera, you know, immediately. And I and I remember having a stand-up fight with them saying, show some respect. You know, mm. these people's families don't even know this has happened at this point. You've picked it up on the radio. And it really was a stand-up fight, you know, with, with the head of this a TV station. And I said, imagine what you'd feel like if it was your people. Well, lo and behold, they did have an incident not that long afterwards where some of their people, I can't remember if it was one person, was killed in an accident. And I thought, you know, now mm. you know what that feel, feels like. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, in your research, have you found that wrong decisions when handling a disaster have had a long-lasting impact on people? Yes, there are several examples of, of that. And that is, of course, uh, very difficult for those who have uh, handled it. And again, it has to do with uh, the hindsight. The, uh, you know so much more uh, maybe a month after something happened because then you can go back and really scrutinize uh, what happened. And uh, a couple of examples uh, that I could mention is, uh, uh, for example, the, the big uh, fire in London in the Grenfell Tower that I'm sure you heard about uh, in Australia, mm. uh, where lots of people died. And in the beginning, uh, the firefighters uh, told uh, people in the building to stay put, not mm. to evacuate because they thought that everything uh, was under control. 
And mm. of course, that has been heavily uh, criticized mm. and it was a wrong decision. But at mm. the time, uh, people and the people in charge thought that was the right uh, thing to do. And that was uh, with what uh, would save most, uh, most of the people. Uh, another example I could mention is uh, has to do with uh, top management making the wrong decisions and uh, there was a big uh, accident in Canada in 2013 in a small town called uh, Lac Megantic. You might have heard about that too where at, uh, uh, a train carrying lots of uh, tanks with uh, crude oil exploded in a town and uh, 55 people died. And then the CEO of the company decided that he should not go to the town. He should not meet the family members. He did not want to meet with the, with the representatives of the media. And uh, in hindsight, and all uh, theories about crisis communication say that that was a wrong decision to take because people really want to hear from the person who was in charge uh, of what happened. And in his case, he arrived in the town four days afterwards and he was hunted by media and he really did a poor job and, uh, and uh, got to be, uh, became the enemy of the people of the town. And that was, of course, a very, very wrong decision to take. Whereas if he'd gone straight away and faced up to what had happened, it would have been a much more authentic response, wouldn't it? Yes, and he should have met with the, the people directly affected. He should have talked to the first responders who helped there. He should have uh, talked to the, the family members and he should be, have been available to the media. In my opinion, that's also part of the job of being a CEO of a company. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this past, well, first of all, um, do you have any suggestions for how traditional first responders can improve their work and be, be even more prepared for handling the human side of a disaster? Yes, well, let me first say that uh, in my opinion and after researching this book, I found that there are so many good first responders around the world doing a fantastic job, uh, but everyone can, can improve what they do. And uh, one suggestion is to also have exercises that focus on, on the personal side of a tragedy. Uh, and it could be something pretty simple, like how do we set up a family assistance center, for example? What if uh, an airline crashes uh, somewhere remotely? Where do we organize a family assistance center? How do we staff it? Uh, what kind of technical equipment do we need? Uh, that can be done uh, also as a tabletop exercise where you just focus on, on that part of it. Uh, and uh, in my opinion too, I've mentioned these after action reports and you can learn quite a bit just from reading uh, reports about uh, uh, how uh, various tragedies have been handled. One example is the uh, shooting in Parkland in 2018. Uh, where quite a few things did not go as planned. And uh, I read the 450 pages report about it and it's very, very interesting. And I think something to learn for everyone, uh, traditional first responders and also other people who handle uh, a disaster. So I, I think to the last point is that everyone needs to think about long-term effects and realize that uh, people will have uh, reactions to a disaster, not just uh, when it happens, but uh, for several years afterwards. Mm. I'm sure Shannon will um, make a comment about that too. So this, speaking of that and that longevity, this past week has been 10 year anniversary of the terror attacks in, uh, Oz, um, on Utoya. What would you say are the main long-term needs of individuals involved in that disaster? I could talk about that for many, many hours because uh, there has been lots of reports about that, as you can imagine, uh, since it's now 10 years since uh, the terrorists killed eight people in Oslo and 69 on the island of Utøya. And again, what we have found is that even 10 years after there is a big need for a psychological uh, follow-up. I think the Norwegian government did a great job uh, in the beginning. They made sure that people had a psychologist or other people they could talk to for the first year or so. But we found that uh, even now uh, people need help. 
and not just uh, the survivors and not just the bereaved, but also the friends of the people who were on the island, who have felt that uh, they were a bit uh, further away from what happened. Mm. And of course they were, and they felt that uh, maybe we don't deserve help because we were not on the island. We didn't see what happened. We are just friends of someone who is uh, mm. struggling, but they too need help. Uh, and it's the same with the siblings and the more remote family members who also have a need to, to, to talk to people uh, even uh, 10 years afterwards. But what we also found works well is what we have a good practice of in Norway and in many other countries is uh, support groups, uh, which are groups that are formed by uh, individuals who were somehow affected by the tragedy. And the support group in Norway uh, that was started after this uh, terror attack uh, still has about 1,800 members and they organize uh, uh, yearly meetings, they organize uh, courses, and they have uh, uh, lots of focus on, for example, when a movie comes out, they, come, they give advice to the members about how to handle that. So support groups uh, is uh, really a, a good thing to have. And actually the Norwegian government is, uh, is giving them a, a little bit of money each year so that they, they can keep their work, uh, work going. And uh, I'm sure we will talk about that later with, uh, with other people in, in this call. Uh, we have found that uh, it's very important to have a monument. Uh, unfortunately, there has been many uh, large discussions in Norway about the monument for the terrorist attack in two 2011, and we still don't have it finished yet, but it will be finished. And it's very important for the survivors and the bereaved and everyone involved and even first responders to have a physical place to go to where you can remember what happened. Okay, well, thanks very much, Shell. Um, we will come back to you and I'm sure even our speakers uh, will have some questions for you. Um, but I'm going to move on to Shannon now. So um, Shannon Hood is a private counselling, um, has a private counselling practice and works as a principal consultant and supervisor for Converge International, um, which is well known to many people in the sector. For the past two decades, he specialised in working with emergency service personnel and that's been really all over Australia. Um, he's also delivered mental health training across Australia. He was just saying he was doing it remotely yesterday for ambulance in the ACT and what a challenge that, that has been. And he's been a presenter with ESF's Mental Health Matters program. In 2009, he was awarded a special commendation for mental health services delivered to firefighters, uh, volunteers in the days and weeks um, following Black Saturday. And he's also spent 13 years as an operational volunteer with SES in South Australia. He's now located in Melbourne. So thanks for joining us, Shannon. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, so tell us about what you took from your work after Black Saturday in terms of how people were helped to deal with what they experienced. Yeah, okay. I guess to, to set the scene at the time, um, as you mentioned, I was living in South Australia. And so I was embedded. So South Australia sent a lot of volunteer firefighters in response to Black Saturday over many deployments. And the practice then um, was to embed mental health professionals who were known to the firefighters in amongst the firefighting crew. Um, and so we left Adelaide together with the firefighters and traveled for their five day deployment. And then we were there to support them um, whilst they were doing their firefighting work in, in Victoria and then traveled back with them. Um, and I did two of those deployments um, with the South Australian team amongst many others who were part of the mental health team based in South Australia. Um, I guess the thing that stood out to me from that Black Saturday experience was twofold. Uh, firstly, um, we were able to, um, we were a known quantity to the emergency services personnel. Um, we were embedded with them. And then we were able to do that ongoing follow up. And I really appreciated what Shell said about the longevity and the long um, impact that it takes. And, and one of the things, well, probably the greatest thing that stood out to me personally and professionally 
was um, I stayed with that team for another six years. And generally speaking, most people, um, as a result of that Black Saturday deployment, um, tracked pretty well um, afterwards. And I think that response was um, really quite effective. Um, what stood out though was that a number of people who didn't go quite so well as a result of their Black Saturday experience were actually still dealing with stuff from Ash Wednesday 25 years earlier. Um, and that was uh, quite a surprise to me um, how that uh, experience in 2009 uh, for a number of our South Australian firefighters um, was triggering of their firefighting experience more than 25 years earlier. Um, so that, that was a big standout for me in terms of professional interaction. Mm, okay. So often when people talk about disaster preparedness, it's in relation to, you know, the preparedness of the response agency, of the community. But what about psychological preparedness of people? How can we do that better? Yeah, I guess there's two things that stand out to me in that regard. And um, I'm pleased to say that a lot of emergency services agencies are doing a really good job these days of um, pre-incident training, um, making that sort of foundational as part of an induction process into the agency, um, and even doing really good work around pre-deployment training. So backing that right up just before deployments, like what we were talking about with some, some training. So I think that is really valuable and really helpful. Um, that sort of basic psychoeducation can be really helpful. But the other thing that stands out to me that I haven't seen yet that I think would be really interesting to explore is I know a lot of emergency services agencies, particularly volunteer, um, they have an extra level of expectation for people who might go on deployment for their physical preparedness to be even listed on a deployment team. And I find, I would see that as quite an interesting thing to explore as well, is, um, is there an, an extra level of preparedness psychologically that would be good as a base level, um, just to make sure that people are going okay. You know, we all have ebb and flow in our wellbeing and that might have something to do with our family life or our work situation and all of those things. And we don't wanna be sending people off on these kind of deployment experiences when they're at a, and, and a low in their current well-being. So they're starting from a low base and then we send them into these kind of critical situations. So I think something around that space would be worth thinking about around, um, particularly around deployments and how we manage that. Just making sure that people have got a base level of well-being before we send them into those places. And the other thing about that that we spoke about in the Mental Health Matters workshops as well, and it was when Cliff spoke about his lived experience of trauma, and it was about how important it was to share that so that, you know, team leaders understand and, and can be respectful of that and, um, you know, ask you to do things according to what's going to be right for you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That that willingness to step up. And I think I think I'm pleased to say that in the years I've been doing journeying this, I think generally speaking, emergency services agencies are getting better at allowing people to speak up and self-declare and you know, but I think there's still a long way to go in particularly in some agencies more than others. Yeah. 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 So how can we help people understand in advance what a trauma reaction feels like what what it is how do we know we've got a yeah. trauma reaction? yeah yeah well i look i would say that um every trauma reaction is different so to some extent there is no preparing you for exactly what you're going to experience and not to do with emergency services but i've had my own kind of trauma experience um to do with more of a family context and i find it can, kind of found it unusual and interesting in the midst of all of that that I was experiencing my own trauma reaction, but I was sort of having an, almost an out-of-body experience saying, well, I know what's going on here because I'm aware of trauma response. I know the sort of symptoms to look out for. And here they are in me unexpectedly happening this morning um, based on some news and things that I'm experiencing right now. And I guess I had that lived experience and I could see the value in being able to equip people with both basic education, but also, um, you know, emergency services tend to love to tell war stories. I think the ability to hear one another's stories from all sorts of different perspectives, but also to be sharing more of those stories about um, 
how I experienced a particular event, what I did about it, what it was like for me, how I responded, what was helpful, what wasn't so helpful. I think telling some of those stories would be um, in a more managed and int intentional way would be really valuable um, to be able to hear that from colleagues who've experienced something similar. What yeah. about family? What what can we do for family to help people, you know, first responders? You know, they, they yeah. go away, they come home. The family's seen it on the news. They've seen how terrible it is on the news. But, you know, they don't really know what it feels like to be there and see it and smell it. And Yeah, that's such a great question. And, um, you know, even on the Black Saturday deployment, um, <clears throat> we had experience and that was you know, back in 2009 and social media back then wasn't what it is now but we had the lived experience of um, supporting people one guy in particular had an incident on the fire ground where I was with him in the hospital and his family were contacting him with more up-to-date information than many of the people here in Victoria had because just word had somehow spread and you know um that that um reality of families finding things out so quickly um through informal channels is really really difficult and so i would say one thing that the emergency services could really look at is investing heavily in getting ahead of that curve like when when things happen to make the family really high on the communication list because they could know that if they don't contact them within half an hour of it happening, within 45 minutes, the family's going to start to hear rumours on the grapevine and you want to kind of nip that in the bud. So I think that proactive communication can be helpful. I think one of the really clever things that some agencies have done with that um, with that uh, pre-incident training work that we talked about before, the, the preparation and information is inviting families along to those sessions. And so really encouraging, um, so if you imagine like a volunteer fire brigade or the SES or any one of those agencies, um, when they're doing that information session, talking about these are the kind of reactions you might experience and this is what trauma might look and feel like, some of the really good agencies, I think, are doing a great job of inviting families into that conversation because um, sometimes it's the families that notice it or at least are more attuned to it before the emergency responder themselves. And they will be able to provide a fantastic support for the person, but sometimes it's about spotting it and knowing about it. So I think communicating with them in the middle of the emergency, but also including them right upstream with some of that information is really important. That's fantastic, Shannon. And I mean, it's a perfect segue in the sense of um, you obviously know the work that we did with Mental Health Matters and the idea of um, involving family in that sort of foundational training of recognising those signs and symptoms was something that the volunteers told us they wanted. And mm. we've actually now applied for a grant to run that sort of a program next year. So um, we're, we're really looking forward and hopeful, hopeful of doing that. The other thing that came to mind when you were speaking was I wonder how many agencies actually do crisis plans where, where the situation that they're managing is the, the death or the serious injury of their own people. I suspect, I could be wrong, but I suspect not many and what I've seen more recently is that people are very, um, very, very concerned about the, how they communicate with family to the point that they sort of skirt around instead of being very, very upfront. Um, what do you what do you think about that? Okay, well, I guess there's two there's two parts there. I probably wouldn't comment or know about the extent to which emergency services are actually including those in their crisis plans. Um, and the I fact don't that I don't mind and I hope they yeah, are. Yeah, I hope they are too. The fact that I haven't heard about it um, would, you know, yeah, I don't know of any that are, but I think it's a, a wise thing to be thinking about. Um, I, I think um, I think in terms of information delivery. When people are in a heightened level of arousal, that is not the time to be sort of trying to be delicate and skirt around and that, you know, what, what people need are really clear, precise understandings of the facts um, across the board. 
Um, and um, I think family is no exception to that. And so um, I think I think precision, clarity, conciseness is really important when communicating generally in a crisis, um, yeah. but in particular with family. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I mean, many people today uh, have got PTSD um, because their trauma was not addressed at the time. How can we be? How can we be better at intervening early, both as a leader, as an agency, as an individual? Yeah, look, I th I think um, I think in some I mean that's sad at a number of levels that that is the case and it's it but it is the reality. What's even sadder is that situation in the context of how good and well researched and reliable some of the tools are that we have at our disposal to deal with these traumatic response. Um, Shell mentioned earlier EMDR, just one of the many things that we know works very effectively, um, but. But um, as mental health professionals, we can't engage in that if people aren't, if we're not connecting with them. And so I think... Can you explain, sorry, Shannon, what, for, not everybody's going to know what EMDR is. So EMDR um, stands for Eye Movement Desensitisation Reprogramming or Reprocessing, depends. Um, and so basically it's a therapeutic technique where you have people tell their story um, in the context of um, engaging their eyes through some sort of technique where you have their eyes moving. Um, and there's all sorts of theories that underpin why it might work, but the reality is that it provides a, an environment and a mechanism that makes people feel um, a greater ability to recount that story that they may need to um, return to and reflect on in order to process the trauma. So it, um, I won't go into the theories as to why it works, but essentially that that is what, what the process okay. is. So the therapist will engage in the person's eye movement and in, make sure that's happening whilst the person is telling their, their or retelling their story. Um, so, But it's a good example of many examples of great therapeutic techniques that we have that we know are quite effective. Um, but in answer to your question, I would say the thing that really still lives on is the stigma. Um, and I think we just need to bash away at that creature um, and try and see what we can do about, um, you know, we know that if we can if we can get access to people soon after, not immediately after necessarily, but soon after an incident and start helping them journey through the processing of that, it can lead to really great outcomes. Um, but if people are keeping it buried for 26 years, like, some of these guys who went on the deployment in 2009 and hadn't processed their stuff from Ash Wednesday, um, that's a tragedy not just for those 26 years, but actually um, the process then of working that through becomes a lot harder therapeutically than if it had been addressed a, a lot earlier. So, yeah, absolutely. It's the stigma that I would I would focus on if I wanted to kind of get to that. I don't know whether you saw 60 Minutes the other night and it was the discussion about the murder of the little boy James Bolger over in Liverpool. Um, I was working in Liverpool um, just before that happened, so I was interested in it. But they were interviewing the police officers in relation to that and that was many years ago now. It happened in 93. And just everyone, the police officers, the solicitor, all of them that were talking about that were clearly still so badly affected by what they had to go through in that. And um, it was so evident when they were speaking. Yeah, and, and New South Wales Police is one of my biggest clients still today. Um, and um, so I can resonate with some of the stuff that the police experience. But um, I find it really interesting you broadened that, just like Shell did, to beyond the police themselves, but the solicitor and various others. And one of the things I think is fantastic, certainly with the support that is provided um, by Converge to New South Wales Police, is they are very intentional about it, including family members and going more broadly where it needs to. Um, in recognition of that um, that challenge that is faced, not just by the officers themselves, but by that sort of ring effect that that can occur. So, yeah, absolutely, we can provide that support to the people involved and then to their immediate circles, um, because yeah. they will be affected too. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, Shannon. We might leave it there and we'll move to Graham Dwyer. Um, thank you. So Graham is the Dr. Graham Dwyer is the course director at the Centre of Social Impact at Swinburne University, where he teaches in the areas of social social change and leadership. His research examines the way that we can make sense and learn from natural hazard events such as bushfire. And he's recently completed a research study with Professor Leanne Kutcher from the University of Sydney in partnership with the CFA, which focused on ways in which emergency management organisations, primarily firefighters, commemorate and remember major bushfire events. His recent work has brought attention to the important ways that different types of um, commemoration can facilitate healing amongst those emergency management practitioners who have lived through difficult and challenging experiences. So very, a really nice link to what Shell talked about earlier and, and specifically with the um, memorial that they're doing in Utoya, which had all sorts of problems. Um, I don't know whether you're aware of that, Graeme, but I'm sure Shell will fill you in. So please start by telling us how your recent research came about, what was the aim, who you spoke with. Thank you, Susan. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I meet with you today in Wurundjeri land and acknowledge all elders past, present and becoming, and indeed all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are watching today. This study emerged from some doctoral research I did back in 2015, where I interviewed 87 emergency management practitioners who were quite heavily involved in responding on the day to Black Saturday, the Black Saturday bushfires of 2009, but also those who were called before the Royal Commission and then I had to go back to their organizations and understand what had happened on Black Saturday, what happened in the Royal Commission and make some kind of sense out of that. And something that recurred across that cohort of people who participated was they reflected very deeply on their experience and they continued to relive it on a daily basis. This was five years after the actual event itself. Mm -hmm. They reflected on how they were treated during the Royal Commission as well. But they also found that they were reflecting on a range of different events, incidences that they had responded to over the course of their career, going right back to Black, going back right back to Ash Wednesday, through to a whole lot of different fires that would have happened in the Southwest in the mid 2000s going back to different types of incidences such as planned burns that had escaped and their reflection on how so much damages could, could have been uh, arisen as a result of that. So when I finished the doctorate, I thought that it was very important to acknowledge that memory is very much part of what a broad array of emergency management practitioners deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in relation to a whole range of incidents that have occurred throughout their career. Okay. And and who did you speak speak to for this study about, about memory? For this particular study, it was primarily firefighters, both career firefighters and volunteer firefighters, but there were also a range of people who would work in different types of policy roles different types of incident control roles. And really it was their reflections on Black Saturday as an incident, what they were recalling on a regular basis, but as we approached the 10 year anniversary, how they were actually feeling. And it was very interesting that it was actually each year after Black Saturday, they would recall different types of moments that they, they were still very much living. For example, mm. some people talked about the, the sound of the fire. Some people talked about mm. revisiting different spaces and places, particularly one that sticks in my mind is somebody who had, to, who had to go to Marysville very soon after the fires had passed through. Some people talked about going to the state control center and how they can feel a sense of unease and anxiety as they as 
the anniversary of Black Saturday would approach, they would feel that they were going into a space that was deeply uncomfortable. Mm. So really the broad array of people who have a role in responding to primarily bushfire, but mostly firefighters for this particular study. So I understand that $25 million has been spent on developing memorials. Is that since Black Saturday? That, that was a, a figure from uh, Regional Development Victoria. That is correct from their website. It's in the region of that, Susan, yes. Okay. And only one of those memorials, those official memorials, was done in consultation with local people, to your knowledge. So the research that we undertook, Susan, we were very interested to understand the role of memorials in the way that people reflect on different events such as bushfire. And one thing that stood out pretty quickly to us was when we looked at Regional Development Victoria's website, it was very clear that there were a lot of memorials, but we could only find one that specifically acknowledged it was done in consultation with local artists, local school children, and the Aboriginal community. So what that spoke to us was, it's clear that when we begin to remember at an institutional level, that there's choices being made about how we remember and indeed what we remember. And once again, we see that there is uh, some great oversights in the process of memory because clearly, there's memorials that have been established that did, ne did not necessarily engage with the broad array of people who would have a relationship with events such as Black Saturday and indeed in a whole range of other traumatic events in their community. So, so in some which, ways, the memorial is triggering more trauma. Yeah. So which is the one that you think is a really good example? So Jindavik Memorial... Uh, by Bobo Shire Council, it's very clear that that's a memorial that engaged with the, the local community. You can see it has a connection to country. It has kinship. It shows a specific piece of artwork. Whereas with a lot of the other memorials, what we see is it's almost like an architectural sculpture, but it's not entirely clear how much of it would have involved consultation with those who were very much part of the response to Black Saturday on the day itself. So okay. we run the risk of creating what are these formal memorials that may not actually speak to the memory that many of our firefighters have actually lived through. So um, there's a lot of tension in terms of what gets memorialised. Um, can you please tell us about what some of those tensions are locally? So in terms of a number of the firefighters obviously live and work in the communities where they responded to on the day of Black Saturday. So there's tensions between how we remember the day or whether we should remember it at all in the first place. There's tensions around should we relive some of the difficult experiences or should we use it as an opportunity to learn from experiences? And it's, it's interesting when you look at how that gets reconciled, it's generally some type of an organizational uh, power structure that makes a decision in terms of what we choose to remember and how we actually remember it. Mm, yeah. And that was played out quite a lot at the, the state level, when we look at how a lot of the firefighters spoke about the 10-year commemoration event that happened at Exhibition Centre did not necessarily speak to so much of what they lived through as a formal event. Mm -hmm. However, what was interesting was the opportunity to reconnect with a lot of people who they had worked with on the day mm -hmm. was a very important part of the healing process. Yeah. And yeah. something I found that was really fascinating was this notion of how we operationalize memory and how we use it in a way that helps us to learn. And there's a, an example of that around the Linton loss of the firefighters, those, uh, those, those staff rides that help us yeah. to reflect in a cathartic way 
but also learn from the experience. Yeah, I'm looking forward to going up on one of those staff rides. I was invited and I just haven't been there yet. Um, I know that institutionalised memorials can potentially add to the anger of people in trauma. What can you tell us about that? Well, in the work that I've done, it's, it's, it's around areas that when we establish something like a, a memorial, it is as if we expect the memorial to do the memory, to, to do the remembering for us about what happened. And a range of the firefighters that I spoke to talked about how the memorial can't do the remembering. It's static, whereas memory is actually a very dynamic type of concept. And it doesn't tell the story of the losses necessarily. And what it also does is in some ways we have a ceremony where we acknowledge the efforts of some people as heroes. But again, from the work that myself and Leanne have done, it's very clear that firefighters are uncomfortable with the label of hero because they know of the limitations of their organization to be able to prevent future bushfires. Mm. Yeah. It's as if it, it, it absolves the community from doing a lot of the work that they need to do to help firefighters in, in achieving a level of community safety. So I'm just conscious of the time and I've got a question for Shannon that I want to ask before he leaves. But we can't please all of the people all of the time, can we? So how does your research help that thinking, Graham? I think it brings attention to the fact that it's important that we don't see it as a pleasing exercise, that we see it as memory as a process and respect what people have actually lived through as part of the traumatic experiences that come with responding to events like Black Saturday. And I think the Jindavik Memorial is such a poignant reminder to us all that as we hasten to remember we need to acknowledge what we already know. That is that there's a lot of trauma and memorials can sometimes trigger and prompt that if they're done in a way that doesn't engage. So th I guess that's your key message for anybody thinking about creating a memorial is to engage with everybody involved. Very much so, Susan, absolutely. Mm. Um, we might bring Sh Shannon and Shell back in. And I've got a question for Shannon here, and it says, grief, wellbeing, preparedness for deployments. How could this be assessed or measured? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I guess there's um, two things that come to mind. One is that there's some really good standardised assessment tools. There's a whole raft of them that could be utilised and accessed for that purpose. They're not fail safe, but they would give a good measure. I think the other thing um, that would be worth thinking about is making sure that there's um, a recommendation or a referral or some sort of check from people who are known by people on the ground, you know, so whatever the structure is, that there would be a, a superior who'd be willing to say, yeah, I think this person is ready and appropriate for deployment. Now, in, in theory, that is meant to happen, you know, all the time. But I think if there was that little step gap that said someone's got to say, this person I think is appropriate and suitable for deployment in a more formalised way, not just from the fact that they meet all the training criteria and all of those things, but in their personal opinion, they are appropriate psychologically and where they're at. Because generally speaking, people on the ground will know what their family circumstance is, what mm. other pressures are going on in their life. Um, and I think there's elements of that. But I would say that the appropriate answer here is to really build something that suits the agency. You know, every agency has its own culture. And so to find something that works well for the agency, um, combination of standardised assessments and or local referrals would be something that would be a starting point, I think. This comes back to a key element of our Leading for Better Mental Health program that we're running at the moment. It's about leaders absolutely understanding and knowing their people and knowing what's going on in their lives in order to recognise change in them. 
and therefore being able to say, you know, well, do you really think this is the right thing for you to do at this time, given everything else that's going on in your life? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, a lot of the times we can really benefit by looking at this stuff through a physical lens. And, you know, if someone was known that they were they'd busted their ankle playing basketball and a deployment came up, then you would expect a responsible team leader would say, well, how's the ankle going? You know, is this the right time? Or maybe you wait for the next one or maybe we give it a miss this time. And I think we're quite comfortable having those physically based conversations and just sort of taking that to another level where it's not awkward or uncomfortable but it's just said out of genuine concern I think yeah. is that would be a great thing. Thanks Shannon and I understand if you need to drop out in, in a moment. Uh, Shell, a question for you from Rachel. Um, have you come across any interesting research focused on organisations that have a large volunteer workforce? Yes, uh, there are several that come to mind and uh, I would mention uh, uh, the organization that was formed after the terror attacks in uh, in New York uh, on 9-11. It's called Voices of 9-11 and uh, it's really worth looking into the, the work they are doing. I, in my opinion, they are doing excellent work with bringing together everyone who was affected by that uh, tragedy. And they are doing a lot of work uh, right now because uh, as we all know, in September, it will be 20 years since uh, the terror attacks. Mm. And uh, they are organizing lots of various uh, memorial functions. Uh, they organize and offer uh, several kinds of treatments. And uh, they are also very good at, uh, at uh, making money for their organization by having golf tournaments or, or dinners and, and things like that. I think what Rachel's actually talking about is um, first responder organizations that are actually volunteer based, like the CFA or the SES or Red Cross, those organizations. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't have any names uh, that I could come up with right now, but I know that in the States, and especially in California, they have uh, a lot of good uh, uh, groups uh, for firefighters, for example, who we all know are very active uh, even right now. Mm, okay. Um, there's no more questions there. Do either of you have a question for each other? <laughs> no? Okay, well, we might um, we might finish it up there if there's no more questions. So I'll thank you all, Shell, Graham and Shannon. And just a reminder that a link to this recording will be on ESF's website in the coming days. Um, it will also be in our e-newsletter. So if you don't uh, receive our e-newsletter and you'd like to do so, you can subscribe uh, via our website. So we'd uh, be very happy to be able to send that to you. So thank you for joining us today and uh, I hope I see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.